Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Daffy's Roundtable. Today, you are getting another from the car intro. <laughs> no, but for real, today we sit down with a good friend of mine, Reed from Swift Tail Vet or Basil Exotics, and we talk about the importance of telemedicine, how telemedicine advanced reptile keeping, and what motivated Reed to start Swift Tail Vet. We also talk about common diseases in both reptiles and amphibians, quarantining your animals, what to do when you bring in a wild caught animal, and how to care for an entire collection. And, what Swift Tail Vet can do for you. Really, there's a lot of very good information in this episode and I'm super excited for you all to hear it. But before we do that, allow me to thank Exoterra for sponsoring this podcast and making this episode possible. Exoterra makes quality products for our pet reptiles to make them feel at home. Okay, without further ado, everybody, please help me welcome Reed from Swift Tail Vet and Basil Exotics. Reed, Hi. hello. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time it, coming. It has. I've been asking you to join us for years, but uh, finally Reed is here and uh, it's going to be a very exciting episode. Um, so before we dive into all the, the fun stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and where you're currently working, I guess, is the mm -hmm. best way to phrase it. Okay. Um, so where am I going to start? where I started keeping reptiles. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. From the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So like where you started keeping reptiles. So I was born reptiles. in 1997. <laughs> in no. um, so yeah, I guess I started keeping reptiles. Well, I started keeping exotics. I started with axolotl. I was in tech school and I did a project. I was obsessed with axolotls and someone else actually got the topic before me and I was really sad. And I think that that made me so sad that I'm like, okay, well, if I can't do a project on them, I'm gonna have to have them. I'm gonna go get them. Yeah, so my sister's nice. friend, Leah, actually, she was breeding axolotls, um, and I was gonna get some from her. Before that, actually, I went to Critter Jungle because she told me that there was Shout sometimes <laughs> some axolotls at Critter Jungle. And I went in and I talked to somebody and they were like, oh, uh, my friend Fadi, who works here, also has some axolotls. Nice. And I was not picturing you. <laughs> I was picturing an old, not an old man. I can be that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got some eggs. Um, I ended up getting eggs from Leo. Okay, nice. And I hatched them out, documented the process. Was very happy when they actually hatched. Um, and then, yeah, I kept a few, sold some to some friends, got them into the hobby. Um, and then just started rescuing a whole bunch of other That's axolotls nice. that just kept coming up. So um, I rescued one that was like super anemic. I bought it because I was like, oh wow, like a pure white axolotl. That's so <laughs> cool. And then I brought it home and I did more research. I'm like, oh, it's just really anemic. And did it, were you able to like? Yeah, yeah. So I, I did grub pie and I was, syringe feeding it under the water wow it was weird i don't i don't even know if that was really the best thing to do at the time i didn't really know anything um but it it came back to having color so yeah, and, and it, it kind of revived yeah and then it got overweight because i overfed it but yeah uh that was my first that was my first exotic pet that's awesome um so you you raised the, the babies did you have to do brine shrimp and all the life oh, food yeah. and all of that oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of work. It was yeah. way too much work. That's yeah. That's why I stopped working with them as well. Yeah, <laughs> just the salt everywhere coming out of like. Yes, the the brine shrimp machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bubbles. And then if you forget out. them for like twenty four hours too long, they stink. I don't know if you've ever. I don't think that, that I ever. I've, I've left the brine shrimp like way oh, too no. longer. Like it's still bubbling, but it's yeah. It but just, they all it's, die. They all die, and it just starts to stink. Um, but yeah, I, I, so why did you get out of axolotls? Uh, okay, so. I was obsessed. Yes. I got in too deep with the aquatics. Yes. I had probably nine aquariums nice. in my furnace room <laughs> because nice. we live in a bungalow and my bedroom at the time was in the basement and that was the only free room at the time. Okay. Um, so nine aquariums in the furnace room and ended up finding out because all of the axolotls were they would do well when I had them in the um, in their hospital tanks. When I was changing the water and treating it with Prime every day to get the ammonia and like the nitrate out. Yeah. But then as soon as the 24 hours stopped, or when I put them back into their, I guess when I put them back into their regular tanks and I wasn't doing the water changes every day, they started declining again. Their gills would shrink. They would they wouldn't eat. Um, they would get like the ammonia, like all the red splotches. Okay. 
and I couldn't figure it out because the ammonia was always good and I was using like the test kits and everything, the ammonia was fine. And it was because the nitrate in the tap water where I live was like way too high. So no matter how many water changes I did, there was always just way too much nitrate. Okay. So yeah, some of the fish that I had that were more hardy were doing fine, but like the axolotls are very fragile. So they were just like mm -hmm. not happy. Okay, yeah. awesome. So that's why I got rid of those. And then, and then you, I got my first chameleon. And then you got your first chameleon. Yeah, awesome. Wasabi, he was a veiled chameleon. He was really sweet. No, he wasn't, he was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I that's liked a, him a lot. Sometimes the, the attitude is what makes them- I love the ones with the attitude, absolutely. but I'm really afraid of getting bitten. <laughs> and I know that it's kind of weird that I've never been bit by an animal so far. You've never been bit at all by any animal? By any animal. I've, I've been grazed by the tooth of a Pac-Man frog once. That. Okay, and when I was a kid, a hamster bit me, but... That's probably worse than all reptiles. But like, hamster bites. dogs and cats in the clinic, all the reptiles that I've had... I get bit like every day. All the mean <laughs> reptiles that I've had, no one's ever bit me. That's, that's... I guess you gotta now play a competition to see how long you can last working with animals every day and not getting bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's not that favorable when you're in a, the clinic setting and you're being the restrainer, so when you're holding the animal, for the person, yes. the other attacker or vet or whatever that's like doing whatever procedure to the yes. animal and you're a really jumpy person and the animal goes to bite and you go oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, Have you ever ha had someone else get bit because of that? Um, yes and no. I am very, I was always very clear that I'm a jumpy person so I, if I'm gonna be a restrainer someone else is also going to restrain. There's going to be a backup. Okay, so yeah. there's there's the back end and then there's the bitey end. Yes. So I'm always on the back end. That Don't give sense. me the bitey end because you will get bit. And that's how you haven't gotten bit yet. That's how I haven't gotten bit yet. And hopefully I, I have been holding the back end once when someone else got bit. But that was like the, the cat was just bonkers. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there is any any avoiding it. So then you got your first chameleon. Yes. Why chameleons? Uh, I just, <laughs> again, I didn't know anything about like the reptile hobby and like what species was available to have as a pet. And I always grew up thinking chameleons were like these like crazy exotic, like rare. Changes colors every time yeah, you look at anything. Like, <laughs> like it would be so difficult to possess one. Yes. That like, there's just, there's no chance. So I was like on Kijiji one day, I'm like, oh, well, like, I don't know, just look and see what's available. And I saw a veiled chameleon. I'm like, no way, you can have those? <laughs> so I did a whole bunch of research and- uh, Always do your research. Yes, always do your research. Yes. Um, don't be impulsive. Yes. Uh, That's- <laughs> Yeah, anyways, I- Like every other person that wraps on hobby. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I did a lot of research and also bought it impulsively. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both can be true at once. Yes. But do your research. Anyway, yeah, yeah, so you got the chameleon. I got the chameleon um, and I got, well, actually, I got one that was too young at the time to go home. And I had it for a day. And even though I had never had a chameleon before, let alone like, it was almost a neonate. Like it was tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny. Freshly hatched. Yeah. And I don't know, I was just looking at it, looking at its colors. Like I didn't have any like reference to go yeah. off of and like what's normal what's not normal but i just like like i don't know it's just not it doesn't look like it's doing well doing well it yeah. was still like it ate it was moving around but like it was more brown than green it kind of looked yeah it just didn't look like it was thriving so i returned that one to the breeder waited a few weeks and then she gave me a different one a different one um, Did you ever find out if the one you like return survived? No. Okay. No. Yeah. But I remember I named him Pix Pixel. Pixel. I think I named him Pixel. Pixel. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Or, like because they changed color and yeah. they were always <laughs> splotchy. And, like I don't know. I thought that was cute. Very funny. But yeah, um, the second one that I brought home was um, was named Wasabi. He was a good guy. He was a dick though. He was. <laughs> he was a dick. I, I think him. there's a reoccurring theme here. Um, okay. Cool. And then so. From there, um, maybe jump into what do you do for work? Or what did you do and what do you do now? 
Give us that story. Okay, so when I had wasabi, when I got my first one, I was a tech at a local vet clinic and I was learning a lot about clinic life and how vet med works internally and just getting getting my career getting your footing. Yeah, for sure. But I was in a dog and cat clinic. Okay. And although I love dogs and cats, obviously, they're not reptiles. Yes, and reptiles are reptiles the best. Reptiles are so cool. Yes. They're little aliens. I mean we're all aliens on our planet. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, I always wanted to do something with cooler animals. <laughs> so I ended up getting an opportunity with a different vet doing some more exotic stuff, but it didn't end up working out. Through them though, I did meet um, my good friend, Dr. Tara, who we clicked like immediately. Awesome. Um, and she's really awesome because she loves all animals so intensely and I was talking to her about um, just the vet shortage in general but specifically for exotic pets like it's so hard finding an exotic pet like anywhere anywhere in Canada like an exotic uh, pet vet sorry an exotic yeah. pet <laughs> vet yes <laughs> easy to get an exotic e pet yes. not easy to get an exotic pet vet uh, yeah so I experienced that myself. I had a baby chameleon that needed vet care and unfortunately it passed away before I could get the appointment. Yes. Which is very common, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. I mean, not only right now, are they I hear fragile. Like wait, wait times are like over a week, over two oh, weeks sometimes. more. Yeah. Like in, I want to say like August of last year. No. Yeah. August of last year. Um, wait times were looking like October. Wow. So like almost two months. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's just local. Like, you know, it's going to be worse or better in different, different areas. areas. Yeah. But, um, I mean, especially in like the more remote, like towns in Ontario. Yeah. It's like, there's not a vet, let alone a, an exotic vet. Yeah. Exactly. Was, yeah. And, and even here, like even in, in bigger cities, like yeah. how many exotic vets are there really? There's there's a bigger amount in Ottawa, like in Toronto. There's there's quite a few. Is it? Yeah. Um, but if you're gonna talk about like how many more exotic vets there are in Toronto versus Ottawa, but how many more people there are in like the GTA than uh, Ottawa, how many like more pet keepers there are as well. Yeah, it's absolutely. Ju it, the problem is just as it's bad, the same. So. Yeah, of course. There's one. Um, there's one emergency. We were dealing with someone the other day, but there's there's one emergency clinic in like London, Ontario. So not Toronto, but closer. Um, and they don't do exotics at all. So like, even if you had like a pocket pet, like a bunny or something, like yeah. they don't do, right? they don't do exotics at all. So that can be really scary. Right. So that was sort of the motivation of starting, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we've actually said the name yet, but Swift Tail Vet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Nice. Right. So Tara and I decided that we wanted to start Swift Tail Vet, nice. um, which is a telemedicine service for exotics. Um, and we can take clients and patients from all over Ontario. It's different because we're not a clinic. We can't do um, like many diagnostic tests, like x-rays, you know, like skin scrapings, like blood tests, stuff like that. Because it's um, virtual because it's virtual yeah. yeah and to have someone collect samples is just not realistic yeah. um we're not going to train someone to use a needle and Absolutely. collect yeah, yeah, samples yeah. from their tiny little gecko or something so um we essentially do the best that we can given what we have um which is photos videos um history from the owner um and just through talking to them and getting um the owner to kind of be the doctor's eyes, ears, and hands, and walking them through an examination, um, we can kind of get most of the puzzle pieces to lead us into like, okay, what is most likely going on? Mm -hmm. And like, what are maybe like the top three possibilities of what are going on? And so we go through, okay, this is the most likely 
Um, this is the second most likely. This one's a uh, more cost effective option. This one's less cost effective. Money is a reality in our society. Absolutely, so yeah. like it's, we're never gonna shame someone, which I see sometimes, not necessarily in the, the vet community, just everywhere yeah. um, for not doing like gold standard, like everything that you can talk. Money is a thing. It's yeah. just the reality. Absolutely. So. And most people, it's like, well, not most people, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people won't even bring their vet, their their reptile to the vet. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we kind of just give them options. This is, th these are, these are your options. Um, and then past that, these are the other possibilities of what it could be and why we wouldn't be able to treat these options. And so if you're seeing these signs like okay say something is going on there's like respiratory sounds and our top um treatment would be antibiotics oral antibiotics like systemic yeah. antibiotics um that's easy for the client to give the pet um oral medication as long as they're not super bitey <laughs> then you know it's pretty easy yeah um if we're not seeing results with that then it's not a waste of doing that treatment because you're kind of identifying what it's not so yeah. it's still giving you answers and there's no harm it. of like giving them the no. antibiotics if they're not no yeah. there isn't um i mean there's always like the antibiotic stewardship which is making sure that you're using antibiotics responsibly so that you're not creating antibiotic resistance like widespread yeah because that's that's a huge issue like in human medicine and animal medicine you get the just overuse of certain antibiotics and then the the population becomes resistant to it and then those antibiotics don't work anymore right and now all the scientists have to figure out what the new thing is going to be with a new antibiotic, antibiotic yeah. yeah and it's just like all the money going into now new research and it's just we just have to be we just have to be responsible with it so yeah, okay. that makes sense okay um, yeah so so there's yeah so there's no harm in 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 giving the antibiotics, but what about like... I wouldn't say no harm, there's there's limited harm. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's the best option to take. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, right, and, and is there some medicines that, I don't know if you, you said that, I maybe missed it, but are there some medicines that you can't prescribe, can you prescribe anything, or like how does that work? So we can't prescribe control drugs. Um, so that would be control drugs. <laughs> so yeah. like a lot of the more potent, like, um, morphine type uh, painkillers okay. um, for something more serious. If it's going to be something serious enough that we would recommend being seen in person, we're going to recommend that before we let you book an appointment. Right. Um, but like, you know, there's um, for dogs, and we do see dogs and cats too, um, for like dogs that have um, like chronic cough, um, we will do um, like cough syrup. Um, what's the name of it? Hykidin. <laughs> it's called Hykidin. Right. That was the name yeah. you were looking for, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's like an example of something that we could prescribe, but because it's a controlled drug, um, we have to have met the owner in person. So essentially creating that trust. Like, yes, okay. we know this person. Yes, we trust them with controlled drugs. Okay. We can't do that with telemedicine. So um, another, other drugs that we can't, prescribe via telemedicine. Um, I guess maybe not something that we can't prescribe that we don't and won't prescribe is like injectables. Okay. So unless we really trust this person, um, and I don't think that will ever happen unless they're like a tech that has a lot of experience that we know personally, like just there's too many things that can go wrong, but injectables, you have to have the skill of doing injections, uh -huh. um, especially with exotics. It's not as straightforward as like giving insulin injections to a cat, like under the skin. Um, there's a lot of other considerations, especially in different species. Um, like if you do multiple injections in some species, like chameleons, you can get tissue necrosis. So that's something that it just complicates it too much. So we would just essentially recommend going in person. And the whole, the whole, Thing about telemedicine is that we're not here to replace in-person vets we're here to supplement and support their clientele that can't get appointments right. so we're never going to 
say, oh, like we could we could do that. Like you don't have to go into the into right. the clinic. Like we can do that. It's like our clients can't get an appointment in person. Their pet is suffering. She they don't have they don't have anywhere to go. This is a fast option that we're just gonna do what we can to help. So it just gives them an option, and a lot of the time it it makes the difference between you know them holding off and like surviving to get to a vet, you know, if it's a species that's very fragile, um, or, you know, we can even just fix them and get the meds that they need and then their symptoms resolve and yay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yay, everybody uh, wins. I think there's a, a very, uh, I, I don't want to call it a myth, but like people think that reptiles are very um, fragile animals and that the second they get sick they're immediately dying and mm -hmm. that kind of thing is this true in your opinion or do you think that they can be somewhat hardy and there is a point in attempting to try to do something when they get sick yeah um i definitely think that it's always worth trying no matter what the species if they are still alive yes it's always worth trying um because you you can't see the future and you don't know if you know, even if it looks like they're dying within the next five minutes, um, that could last five days for them. You don't know, and that suffering right. could last five days, and that's what you want to avoid. So, um, you know, if it, it also if they're like very much not doing well, and we don't think that putting them through a treatment is um, is humane, even yeah. then we would recommend like seeking a, a humane euthanasia, like going into a clinic and seeking euthanasia okay. um but to answer the question there are very fragile species there are more hardy species um regardless it is always worth it to seek vet care yeah i i, I agree okay and what what is like the most common reasons a reptile would get sick or most common reason maybe like the most common thing that you see or the most common reason people should bring their reptile in to see a vet for? I don't know if that question, I feel like I asked you three different questions that are not related to each other, but. Um. Yeah, ask them again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask one, I'll ask one. What is, what is the most common reason that a reptile could maybe get sick, first of all? I don't think that it's. One specific reason? I, it's not, it's, you know, there's, cause we see pocket pets, we see reptiles, we see amphibians, we see cats and dogs. Um, for the pocket pets, we see a lot of respiratory infections. We see a lot of rats with um, like crackly breathing, sneezing, porphyrin coming out of, you know, yeah. their eyes and their nose. Um, it can be startling, especially if, you know, the owner is new to rats and they're like, it's like, almost looks like blood coming out of their eyes and their nose. Yeah, um, I'll be giving rats after hearing that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's normal. <laughs> yes, it doesn't sound um, normal. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'd say that's, for the pocket pets, that's pretty normal, skin infections. Um, for reptiles, um, not eating is a big one. Um, and almost everything with reptiles comes back to husbandry. Okay. Rarely does it come to, oh, this is just like, like we don't know why it happened. That's like, perfect. You beat me to my next question. Okay, so how important is husbandry when it comes to like? It is everything. Okay. It's the whole, it's the whole pie. It's ninety nine percent of the pie. Okay. Um, husbandry is it's the you are what you eat reptiles, it's the you are where you live. Where you live. Okay, that's awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if there is even one thing, so our intake form is quite extensive, mm -hmm. hopefully it's gonna get even more extensive. Nice. <laughs> but we don't overwhelm people. Um, but there's a lot of husbandry questions in our intake form. We go through that with a fine tooth comb before every appointment and we flag the things that need improving or adjusting. It's, it's never something that like they're doing wrong. People don't do this intentionally. People don't give the, you know, yeah. the incorrect husbandry on purpose. Right, yeah. Um, or, so maybe, or maybe lack rarely. Of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like there's so much skewed information out there, so much wrong information outdated, um, people's opinions that get posted as like, this is fact. Mm -hmm. um, it can be really hard to sift through that and figure out what's, what's the real stuff. Um, so that's where we will flag their husbandry stuff that needs improving, let them know like, okay, they're not eating. It could be a whole bunch of reasons why they're not eating. Essentially, if they don't feel good, they're not eating. Okay. So why are they not feeling good? They could not be feeling good for like whatever reason. Many reasons, yeah. So it's um, not always a heat thing. I was going to ask you if, the, if you, when you start. Not always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wait, a heat thing? 
Well, I was, when you said when you said the most common reason is that is reptiles don't eat. I was gonna ask if 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 it's usually gotcha. like they don't have enough heat on them, so they're not. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, very well could be. Yeah, it's just one of the many reasons. I think the biggest reason that I see is inadequate UVB, um, especially for the diurnal ones. Um, I see a lot of like more fragile in the sense that like they haven't been in the reptile trade for as long as like bearded dragons yeah um so they're a lot more sensitive to improper husbandry because mm -hmm. they're just like they they i they haven't adapted I imagine, to captivity as well yeah exactly they like they think that they're still in the wild yeah. they're and all of a sudden the sun's not working like yeah. <laughs> yeah. i guess i'll die yeah that makes um, sense. so that's that's a big one um so we often will definitely flag that as like a number one priority um, food options for them. So if it's like an omnivorous, like a bearded dragon, and they're only getting insects, mm -hmm. there's a lot of vitamins they're missing out on. There's a lot of like those fresh, right, fresh ingredients that yeah. they're missing out on. So that can be also big because if they're an adult reptile and they've never had salad, it's kind of like teaching an old dog new tricks. Yeah, it's very hard to get them on onto it. Yeah, I've yeah. seen I've seen this as well with the bearded yeah. dragons. Yeah, we um, unfortunately with the not eating ones, we recommend a lot uh, of syringe feeding. Um, so we have critical care supplements um, that is just like a a powder of like mm -hmm. a complete diet um, powder you mix with water. We send like syringes home, and then we instruct and send video guides on like how to syringe feed said species um safely because you don't want that food to like go down the windpipe and then right. and then that's we just want to avoid that so we send them instructions um and then that way they're getting the nutrients allow them to bounce back and then we address the husbandry okay so our first goal is to like make sure that they're not critically ill anymore mm -hmm. and then we can be like okay now let's discuss like let's work on your husbandry let's change the lights let's yeah, is there is there a worry of of moving an animal into a new enclosure while it's in those like do you do you worry that that could make it worse um, in those situations? It's definitely pros and cons. Yes, any moving of an animal that lives in a an enclosure um, is going to be stressed if you put it somewhere else. They're like, I don't know where I am. Yeah, am I going to find food here? I don't know. I'm I'm stressed. Um, Absolutely. If the animal is not well, it's like, okay, what's, what's like the lesser of the two evils? Mm -hmm. Am I going to keep it where it is, where I know it's not doing well and it might get worse where it is? Yeah. Or should I temporarily put it in to something that's like sterile, controlled, that something that I can, you know, like paper towel that I can like assess their output, like yeah. their poos, <laughs> um, yeah. and see if they're eating and they're digesting it, see if their output is actually digested. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a pro to putting them into like a said hospital tank. Um, mites is another big reason why we would say like hospital tank um, because mites can get just into every nook and cranny of an enclosure, especially if you have a substrate. Ask so me. <laughs> just eliminate the substrate, take it out. It's no longer an issue. Wrap it up in a bag, throw it in the trash. Um, and then it, you're just starting from scratch. My so. uh, my biggest nightmare now is mites, mites yeah. and uh, yeah, I'm terrified of them. <laughs> but uh, now you know how easy they are to treat. It, uh, I, well, I wouldn't. I shouldn't say easy. No, no, <laughs> easy is is is. I I I was shocked at how uh, like how much easier it was than I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the process wasn't that bad. The medications honest. are. Yes. Yes. Shout out to Swift Tail Vet for for helping me with that. Mm -hmm. that right. And stay tuned to my other channel for an upcoming video on it. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, when is this gonna come out? And is this, this gonna come out? And no, this will be out way before that. Way, way before that. Um, okay, so you, you mentioned improper UVB. Yeah. The, the common um, uh, like knowledge in the hobby is, oh, you have to change your UVB bulbs every once a year um, because they change their, their percentage, they get stronger or weaker or whatever. Is there a worry of too much UVB or um, 
or let's say if someone left the UVB bulb for too long and it got too strong or like something like that. Like is, I know there's, there's benefits to having UVB, but is there also disadvantages to having UVB? Um, there's never a disadvantage to having UVB. Any animal that lives on planet Earth is going to be exposed to UVB unless you are a human who never goes outside. Okay. Um, which there are people that do that. <laughs> um, so there's no disadvantages to having UVB. I would say because our enclosures are so controlled, like we control every aspect of these animals' lives. Um, you know, you have to consider, is this animal nocturnal? It can still benefit from UVB, but are they gonna be out in like broad daylight with no shelter? No, so maybe don't use like the strongest UVB bulb mm -hmm. um, because that's gonna simulate more of like a, like they're getting more UVB. So right. it's almost like they're more of a diurnal species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, the sun is so strong. <laughs> it's so strong and the, the artificial UV lighting that we provide is nowhere near as strong as the compare. sun. Right. It does not compare. So I think that I just can't speak specifically on can there be too much with these artificial bulbs because I haven't done enough research to understand where that line is. Right. I know that UV is never bad and there are recommendations as per the manufacturer on what percentages, what strengths of UVB to give what type of animal. So yes. uh, shade dweller, Arcadia, yes. yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's actually like one, of, a, one of, yeah, right, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so just, I think overall statement, UVB is never bad and get a UV bulb and follow the manu manufacturer's instructions as to what strength. And do your research. Make. Do your research. <laughs> yes, correct, correct. What are your recommendations for people with um, collections versus one or two pets? In terms of like, you can't really take an entire collection to to uh, a vet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how, how do you make sure that everyone is safe and healthy? Um, if you're going to choose to have a collection, you are choosing to be the eyes and looking for any health issues for times however many animals that you have. I think that it's less so like, what would you recommend differently for people with big collections, but it's just know that you're getting into, okay, you have one animal, okay, now you have 20 animals, you have one animal times 20. Times you don't 20, just yeah. have like 20 animals times, one, if that makes any like sense. Like it's 20 yeah. times the work. It's 20 times the work. Right, yeah, yeah. So just know what you're getting into. I know that a lot of reptile keepers, you know, you get a reptile or amphibian or exotic pet or whatever, and you're like, oh, this is a lot less, wor less work than like a cat or a dog. I could get 20 of these. And it's just like the same work as a cat or a dog, except when stuff goes wrong. And then you go into your reptile room and three of them have health issues and all of a sudden they need like, around the clock care times three and now you're overwhelmed. So I guess my biggest advice would just be like really monitor every single one. Like don't let the care of one trump another. Mm -hmm. Cause as soon as you turn your back on one and, and focus on like, oh, I got like a new species. The one that you got, you know, last year might suffer. <laughs> so- And quarantine any new animals you bring in. Oh, Quarantine. In quarantine, yeah. Not just like, oh, uh, I'm getting a new species that's like uh, a species that can cohab. I'm going to keep them into a, a, an enclosure that's right next to their main enclosure. No, like keep it in another room. Like if you can do like separate like air <laughs> circulation, <laughs> yeah. which yeah, different tongs, all hard that to do in yeah. like a normal house. But yeah, different tongs, sterilize everything. Like keep them very separate because yeah. there are viruses out there that can just spread yeah. in like a matter of like hours or days or like just no time at all. Like it yeah. can happen like that. Absolutely. Quarantine, keep it separate. Quarantine for like a month minimum. Yeah. Cause yeah. And honestly, I quarantined when the mites, I yeah. quarantined that snake for um, over a month and, and still like it wasn't, wasn't long enough. So quarantine until you're absolutely sure. And then quarantine longer <laughs> even. Yeah. Um, but Get a I new 
room in your house for every new animal you that you bring, you bring in. one yes, animal yes. in each room that's just the easiest way to do it <laughs> yeah, honestly it's, yeah. or maybe don't have a giant no i'm just kidding I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not one to say don't have a giant collection but uh, it's it's just again it's like the, a similar point to like the money thing it is a reality that people want these beautiful collections yes you have one i had one yes. i have since pretty much taken it down and <laughs> rehomed a lot of them yes but like it's just it's what people have and like that's not that's not bad absolutely but it's just it's a lot of, and a lot I, of work it is it is a lot of work and i think you also brought up a very good point earlier when you said like you know you brought in new species don't forget the old one i think a lot of reptile keepers that is a tendency that we have yeah um, you know, i've you, been you there get, i did it yeah you get hyper focused on yeah. research when you probably it's a new exciting thing um i always say like a lot reptile keeping is a lot of like doing puzzles mm. and you, you, the new reptile is the new puzzle and you want to yeah. put it all together and, yeah. and you get very excited um i know i just made reptile keeping sound even more nerdy than it really is <laughs> um. i want to i want to see the percentage of reptile keepers and how many of them are adhd <laughs> i i think high i think it's the same thing i don't know if i told you that um the autistics make vaccines and vaccines <laughs> You, you did you did tell me this yes it's yes so yes do, do you want to say? yeah okay <laughs> now that you brought it up you, you i don't know it. who to credit because i don't know who to credit but it was something that i saw online um it was how it was making fun of the whole vaccines cause autism but it was a statistic a comment on a statistic where a lot of uh people who are on the autism spectrum go into the sciences and therefore there is a larger population of people on the autism spectrum who are in fields like vaccine making, I don't know the word. A lot of people who are on the spectrum are in like science research. Are in, yes. Yeah, that make vaccines. So it's like vaccines don't cause autism, autism causes vaccines. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's, laughs> very funny. I think it's true. I, I also think that a, a large percentage of, of reptile keepers uh, probably have ADHD. I think we need to be mm -hmm. like somewhat. And and no offense to the ones that that I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not generalizing here. Like yeah, I'm sure there are some reptile keepers that don't um, have ADHD or don't think they're. I, I personally think I'm a little crazy, so I do I do think. That I you think you're do, a little crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I think you need to be a little bit crazy to be <laughs> yeah. in this hobby. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what I was, that's what I was trying to get at. But because yeah. um, what normal person has all these animals in their in their basement, right? Yeah. Um, and, anyway, and we flock together. And we flock together. Yes, 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 exactly. And we all enable each other. But it's it's that's that's one of the nice nice part about nicer parts about the hobby is is the whole community thing. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I love the expo so much. It's yeah. like uh, an entire room with like minded people who I can go into and just they understand what I'm saying. I don't have to be like, oh, oh yeah, like yeah. Anyway, anyway okay, okay, but yes. when you get to explain and go on a tangent to someone who doesn't, doesn't know. Understand. Yes. And yes. they're like, wow. Oh. Yes, like, I, I agree. I agree. You're like, yeah. I look at and me, then I, I say like the same, yeah. I'll talk to like, I'll talk about like crested geckos to someone and, or like, um, or like morning geckos and like how they're parthenogenic. And I'll talk to someone who doesn't own reptiles yeah. and they're like, oh my God. And then I'll talk to someone who is in the reptile hobby and they're like, oh, I don't like morning geckos like anymore. <laughs> oh, I don't like them. Oh, you're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the binos. <laughs> oh, it's the binos. Uh, these parthenogenic animals are killing me. They keep escaping and breeding everywhere. I have morning geckos climbing up my walls. And why are they so walls. small? And why are they so small? <laughs> I literally last night found another morning, maybe morning what? gecko. Yeah, like it, they're they're everywhere. I'm, yeah, yeah. It's the new North American pest. <laughs> don't get morning geckos. Pests. It really is. It yeah. really is. It's crazy how 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 good they are at getting out of tanks and anyway we're not on the morning wait, wait, wait. yes Pe <laughs> houses that have mice problems get cats but what yes. happens when the pests climb your walls you have to get birds you have to get birds of prey in your house yes but <laughs> or I, chameleons or chameleons yes but i also i look at it the other way is they are the best control yes you know what i mean like now i don't have to deal with this, this is, i wish this was true because i still see spiders everywhere and i'm not that i have anything against spiders but i my train of thought <laughs> was yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> tarantulas uh, fine spiders <laughs> i don't get the difference they're the same thing <sighs> one's fluffy and chunky <laughs> it's the fluffiness isn't it's it? the it's gangly it. The gangliness. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. Yeah. Anyway, I still see spiders, so I thought they would be best controlled, but no, they were not best controlled. No, no. Yeah. the spiders are eating the yeah. baby morning. The geckos. baby morning geckos, maybe. <laughs> and you're yeah. getting just giant spiders now in your basement. I am getting very big spiders in my basement. <laughs> okay, we're going upstairs. <laughs> I don't want to, do this. to jump off that collections versus less pets question, 
how many of our animals do you think for people like myself with larger collections how many of our animals do you think are sick and we don't even know that's a really good question <laughs> um i think that any answer that i would give is just purely opinion it's okay. just that's okay um i would say more than we think or less than we think it, if, and it also depends on your your definition of sick like mm. Everything okay. everywhere is always sick. Right, right. There's okay. always something wrong. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. No matter what the animal you are, if you're a human or a fish, like yeah. you're not perfect. So. Okay, that's fair. There are a lot of parasites. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of metabolic bone disease that is unnoticeable. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of cancer. There's a lot of tumors, malignant, benign. Um, that you don't see. Um, there's calcium, there's like inadequate calcium that, you know, if it was a female, egg binding, you know, that's an issue. There's just so much that can go wrong. Okay. I want to say a hundred percent. Okay, perfect. I, I, so many questions to piggyback off that. Okay, <laughs> so, um, you said, the first thing you said was parasites. Mm -hmm. A lot of us work with uh, wild caught animals. Yes. Um, how common is it that there's parasites or worms or something in a wild caught animal? And then part two of the question is, is it always harmful? And then part three of the question. No, you know what? Answer first. Part seven. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. You can uh, you can do them all. <laughs> okay. And then the part three of the question. Wait, what is, was part two? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, is is deworming? always useful or can can it be more harmful to deworm um, a wild caught animal than yeah cool yeah. Okay. okay so number one again no way to know for sure um, you can assume all of them have parasites okay it lives in the wild there's parasites everywhere yeah um, assume all of them have parasites if it's wild caught a plus uh, protocol is any importer of a wild caught animal um, has a um, parasite treatment protocol. So any new one that comes into their care, they deworm it and they monitor it then to make sure that it's healthy before it goes into the pet trade. Yes. Um, if they have a sick animal that they just got that's wild caught or that anybody gets that is wild caught, not just importers. Right. Um, again, assume that it has parasites, but if it's actively sick, deworming because you are going to assume that it has parasites, there's going to be a immune response to uh, treating for parasites because now the parasites that were in the, the host, the animal, they're going to die. And that is a, is a burden on the animal to now deal with the, these dead and rotting parasites. So the immune system has to now like attack that and make sure that it gets like fleshed out of the animal. Right. So if the animal's immune system is already fighting something very hard and you're going to go and treat it for parasites, it could tip the scale and end up causing more harm than good. Is the issue making the animal sick the parasites? Maybe. So you treat the parasites, maybe it gets better. Maybe it doesn't. It's, right. it's one of those like... Maybe it's not the parasites at all. Maybe something else... You, it's kind of a gamble at that point. It's mm -hmm. it's clearly not doing well. Treating for parasites is very, like, you just kind of do it. Mm -hmm. But it's a consideration, like, okay, doing the parasite treatment could also cause it to pass. Is it gonna die anyways? Is it just like kind of throwing all you got at it? Yeah. It's kind of case by case in that sense, but. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So is there a is there a value in doing fecal tests and finding out what specific species of parasites or worms or whatever are in the animal or is it sort of just hit them with the dewormers regardless? Um, I think that there's always information to be had from any kind of diagnostic testing, whether that's like uh, a negative result or a positive result. You know, positive results saying, this is what we found. And then a negative result is like, we didn't find anything. Or, you know, it's like, 
is what we didn't find. So yeah. you can kind of rule that out or rule that out for the most part. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, like, is there a point of fecal testing? Right. And like, basically, are all are all parasites bad, or can there be good parasites and worms that are like, oh, if it's just this that it has, I don't need to deworm it; it's fine. Um, so I think the general rule of thumb in exotic pet keeping in the eyes of vet care and treating for parasites is, again, assume everything has parasites and unless it's being affected by the parasite, so if it has symptoms of a parasite burden being like, it's eating, it's eating a lot, it's like ravenous and it's losing weight rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well the parasite could be taking all of the nutrients, right. you know, um, that kind of thing or even just it's gone off food can can also be one of them again like it's kind of a there's a lot of questions to be answered mm -hmm. um but unless they're doing poorly because of the parasites then you can kind of just leave them because it's natural for them to have parasites and very few of them are zoonotic which means can be contracted mm -hmm. by humans um so you can just essentially assume that they have them have good sanitary protocol and then <coughs> treat if it's becoming an issue and that's where the monitor all your animals comes in and if you have a big collection monitor all your animals and one more time say it monitor all your monitor <laughs> all your animals monitor all your animals <laughs> all right um what about captive bred animals like, is there, is there ever a worry or concern that they could have parasites or... or um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, parasites also, if you're talking like intestinal parasites, um, I'll just, just, we'll just say parasites. Yeah. Um, if it's an insectivore, you can assume it has parasites because it, regardless if it's where you got the insect feeders, they have parasites. Right. You're not going to treat your feeders mm -hmm. for parasites and then treat your animals for parasites. Yeah, so right, yeah. you can assume that they have parasites. So a good kind of um, parallel to that is people who have cats, if they have indoor cats, they go to the vet once a year and they get their cats dewormed. Even though their cats don't go outside, they're not exposed to like the right. parasites of the world. Yeah. Um, you can assume that they you want to assume that they have parasites because, you know, do they hunt in the house? Do they hunt bugs, mice? Um, they are coming in contact with possible parasites. So you just want to treat it to get it to baseline. Okay. Um, captive bred animals, even though they're not, they, they are not and have not ever been in the wild and exposed to those natural parasites, you can assume that they've contracted some from the insects that they've eaten. Okay. Yeah. And is this something to worry about? Again, no, unless it's causing issues. Okay. Because you can't, you can't just be like treating for parasites every day, every right. week, whatever. Right. Because um, that's also going to be hard on the system, on their system. It, it, it's going to damage them. So, it's not something to be done so frequently that it's going to cause harm. Yeah. The parasite treatment. Yes. Um, but it can be used when it's needed. Right. Yeah. Did is that there, answer the question? It did absolutely answer <laughs> okay. the question. Is there a specific sign that shows that, oh, this, this animal, like, I guess the symptom, the word is symptom. Is there a specific symptom that shows that this animal has parasites that are affecting it? Or could the symptoms display in any way? I don't know if my question makes sense. Yeah, but. yeah. What are the symptoms? Is there a clear symptom to determine if a, a pet is suffering from a yes. parasite burden? Yeah. Um, yes and no. There's okay. more common ones. There's, uh, and then every individual is different. So mm -hmm. you can't just like 100% trust like one symptom that could pertain to say a parasite burden. Mm -hmm. um, so lack of appetite, or sorry, increased appetite and weight loss together. That's that's, that's a good okay. sign okay. of a parasite burden. That would probably be like our first guess mm -hmm. and our first step in the treatment protocol right. um other things that it could be though is like a, just a genetic thing like they, a failure to thrive depending on what age they are but like failure to thrive can also 
kind of come at any age in theory because like genetics anyways yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um other things could be like cancers um you know really there's just a ton of stuff but okay uh at the end of the day it's what symptoms do you have? What's the most likely? What is the easiest to treat? And we choose from there. Have you ever watched the, the show House? No. That the way I'm not big on uh, on medical medicine, shows. Medical shows. Uh, me neither. But House <laughs> House was something we we got into in the house and house <laughs> <laughs> and we got into. It. But anyway, the, the process. The reason I bring it up is the process of like elimination that you just mentioned so, sort of or like what's the easiest to treat yeah. it's kind of the way that he thinks in the show and it's it's, uh, it's very intriguing anyway that's completely off topic but um transitioning or jumping back to swift tail swift tail yeah. vet um what species not to say that i want any animal to get sick but what species or, or would you like to have as a client one day mm, reptile wise well or even not reptile wise i think that kind of overlaps with like what is my favorite reptile? Is it, would you like to see your favorite? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so what is your favorite reptile? Right now, and it right always now, changes yes, every time absolutely. I learn about a new <laughs> cool reptile, yes. is is a tree monitor, all colors. I just love them. Thank you, Dion, for obsessing me with tree monitors and tree skinks. Yes. Something about the lanky tree green guys. You, you Smart, love them, right? yeah. love them. Okay, what's your favorite tree monitor color? Green. <laughs> Green? Yeah, Green. okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, like asking... Blacks a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I think it was an interaction we had upstairs another time, but it was... What's your favorite color? Green, Green obviously. obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're reptile keepers. Yeah. <laughs> you know Always, like, yeah. Like, <laughs> we're reptile keepers. Obviously, green is our favorite color. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And if it's not, it's like, mm, maybe you actually like reptiles. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to like if green. your favorite color is yellow, Maybe you just like flowers. Yeah, not reptiles. Not reptiles. Not reptiles. And if your favorite color is anything other than green, obviously you're not part of the hobby. Mm, get out. Get out. <laughs> okay, so so of that same question, um, uh, what's the most unique or cool species that you've already worked with or that's already come in as a client, I guess? A tree monitor. Yeah, okay, um, nice. And a, a red-eyed tree frog. I do really like tree frogs. And um, we had a red-eyed tree frog stuffed animal when I was a kid okay. and uh so I think I've always just loved those it was, it was my brother so he he loves them too okay nice. um and I messaged him when we had our first red eye tree frog client and he was very happy very that's awesome. excited that's awesome how, how do you how do you I'm, I'm kind of a little off off on tangent here but how do you it's the same thing I assume husbandry and pictures and all that but is there a difference in treating amphibians? Yeah, it's like it's a frog, yeah. I don't know how to even phrase the question. Um, I think the biggest difference between amphibians and reptiles, very similar drugs. The only consideration that you have to have additionally for amphibians is their permeable skin. Mm -hmm. So what kind of like, but at the same time, <laughs> you can, it's easier to give some medications to frogs because you can just put it on their skin. Mm -hmm. So instead of like trying to open up the tiny frog's mouth, just a little drop on the skin. If we have a medication that's formulated for that, great. But additives. So what additives in a medication is going to be an irritation to their skin that might not be an irritation if they get it orally. Mm, interesting. So um, you have a little bit more flexibility in one sense with frogs and a little bit less flexibility in another sense okay, but for the most part they're they're pretty similar and what's what's usually like what's wrong with frogs what's wrong with frogs what's wrong with frogs <laughs> what no, like, is wrong with frogs yeah what, what 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 do they come in for like what are some of the some of the more common things um, that you see? we will get uh skin discoloration so we'll get um like bacterial infection so that's uh like with white tree frogs or the red eye tree frogs um and other frogs <laughs> um it's the the green or like light dots, splotches, kind of looks like snowflakes right. um, on their back. Um, that can change when they change color because they get lighter and darker, whether yes. they're awake or asleep, they're PJs. Okay, um, yeah. So it's very evident um, when they're in their PJs. <laughs> PJs, yeah. 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 Um, that's, a, that's a big one, especially in the bioactive enclosures when there's a lot of contamination risk. Okay. Um, that's a whole other thing. Okay. Um, 
which I will go into. Actually, yeah. Why don't we go into that? Yeah, why don't we go into that? Why why are bioactive enclosures more? Uh... Because it's it's simulating nature, and nature is not sterile. Okay. Uh, so if you have a glass enclosure that you sterilize and you put paper towel down, minimal contamination. Mm -hmm. If you have an enclosure, a glass enclosure that you sterilized originally but then put in a, you know, drainage layer and then soil and then plants and then you Came throw through. bugs in. Yeah. yeah. Um, all of those are contaminants, okay. all of them, all of them. And when you put a frog in a bioactive enclosure, of course, that's great because it's closer to nature. So it's it's great for their like environmental simulation, their mental health. Yeah. Do frogs have mental health? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Yes, it's also... Are all animals sent... What's their sentient? sentience? Yeah. Yeah. I think plants are sentient, too. <laughs> they like music. Yeah, I guess. I'd, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just you're... It's a pro and con. Like, mm -hmm. you're going to create a more suitable habitat for them, but you're also going to introduce risks. There are more natural risks. You could, risks. you could call us to help if you find that they're... <laughs> if they have an infection. Yeah. Um... But with bioactive, unless the enclosure is like restarted or taken down. So like say we had a client who had a frog that had a bacterial infection. It was in a bioactive. We treated the frog for the infection. The infection was resolved, but came back because it's still in the same enclosure. It's still in a bioactive enclosure. Whatever contaminant that was causing this infection is not being removed from its environment. So do you tear down your bioactive? Hurts my heart. Mm -hmm. Tear down the bioactive, restart, sterilize everything, put everything back in and hope that the contaminant has been removed. Maybe it's like something that's in the water. If it's like a paludaria, maybe it's like in like water tubing, mist systems, like it could be anywhere. anywhere so. Yeah you just got to do your best and like it's unfortunately when you're signing up to have these exotic pets like this is what you're signing up for mm -hmm. and like yeah we'll absolutely help you to the you know best degree that we can but it is also going to be a lot of work to figure out and like right yeah get things so are you are you are you team bioactive or team sterile i'm team bioactive okay i'm so team even bioactive if you know what you're doing right because you can say that you're doing bioactive and it's unbalanced. What do you mean by unbalanced? So bioactive is is simulating. Or we should say bioactive. Bioactive. Yeah. There's like a vivarium and there's like a bioactive vivarium. Yeah. So like a vivarium is like you have substrate, you have like live plants in it. Like it's it has life in it yes. and not just the animal. You have yeah. like live plants um, and maybe clean up crew bioactive is it's you're assuming that it has a functioning life cycle right so you have the animal which is like you know star of the show um yeah. you have the food that it's that it eats say it's an insectivore and you give it crickets it also has a cleanup crew which is the bugs that clean up like all like the decaying matter the detrivores the animal poo then becomes fertilizer for the plants and food for the detrivores. And then it's just like kind of- Fertilizer for the plants. It, yeah, it's, it's a just, cycle, yeah. Yeah. If you are going to assume that you have a bioactive enclosure, but the balance is off, so you don't have enough cleanup, cl enough cleanup crew to actually deal with like the bio load, which mm -hmm. is the, the you know the dead plants, the poop, yeah. the, everything that is was alive and now is not alive. Um, then you're gonna get a buildup of, of, of poo, of bad stuff, bad yeah, bacteria, bad bacteria. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what's gonna cause illness. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to make sure that it's well balanced. Well balanced. Is there a surefire way to like know if your enclosure is well balanced? That was my question. Yeah. No. No. Um, no. Not definitively. Yes, in the fact that like okay, you have a crested gecko. It ate a bunch of food last night. You see a huge poo in there in the morning and then by the evening it's gone yeah or it's mostly gone because you see all like the like isopods uh, or um yeah. springtails eating it all up that's a really good sign that it's that it's doing well it's okay. it's quite balanced okay if they have a poo <laughs> love that word <laughs> um and 
it sits there for days. Yeah. Maybe it you don't gets moldy, it grows yeah. fungus. Like, it's not going anywhere. That's not very balanced because mm -hmm. that's just going to keep. You don't have enough cleanup crew up. or the cleanup crew is not surviving, so there's not enough moisture or something's imbalanced. Yeah. yeah. If your plants aren't growing or if they're dying even, then like the nutrients from the soil aren't being picked up by the roots and being put into the life. So yeah. like, where is, where is that going? And it's going to be like, there's going to be too much nutrients there in the soil. It's the bacteria is going to feed on it. You're going to get a bacterial bloom. The bacterial bloom could infect your, you know, cause an infection in a, in the an animal. Like, yeah. Fascinating. Knife. What about over, I, I know I heard one thing about like with frogs specifically is like, or like with dart frogs, everyone's like always oh, keeping them damp. Don't keep them wet. Keep them mm -hmm. damp. Don't keep them. What about over moisture, um, extremely soggy substrate? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you can create um, a. What's the word? It was just in my brain. <laughs> I'm keeping that in. A bog. A bog. No. <laughs> swamp. Swamp. Yeah. You can okay. create a swamp. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A swamp. Which is bad. Which is bad. Um. I'm, okay, I mean, like, an actual swamp is not bad. It's fine. Ah. <laughs> I call it swampy. I, I don't know what the actual word is that okay. I'm trying to look for is. A lot of water that's dirty and gross <laughs> that is going to cause a stagnant. bacterial. Yeah. Stagnant, yeah. stinky yeah. water. The stink is the, is the bacteria. And bacteria farts. So I know, <laughs> so I know when when a frog sits in it, they kind of like inflate a little bit and they start to like absorb some of that moisture. Um, is there like a? Do you see? Do you ever see that? Have you ever seen that as a case? Ask me a question again. Like you know when like frogs sit in it. Like I've seen I've seen pictures of like inflated legs. I don't know what the word. Is. Oh, bloat, bloating. That's what I look. Gotcha. Like. Yeah. Do you ever see frogs with bloating because of this issue or because of any issue in general? I guess. Uh, I, again, bloating is one of those symptoms that can be caused by a bunch of different things. Um, yes, bloating can happen. <laughs> bloating is like edema, which is like water retention, um, which can also be caused by a bunch of different things. It can also be caused by kidney failure. Mm -hmm. Why is the kidney failing? Okay. Is it diet slash lack of nutrition? Is it um, genetic, are they predisposed to this? Is it something that they've been, like a toxin that they've been exposed to, whether it's like bacterial overload or like chemical, like they've, there's something in the air or something in like the uh, cleaners that is being used in the right. um, tank. Again, could be like so many different things. Um, so like what's, what symptom or what cause of it could be treated? Bacterial and like yeah, from there, I don't know. <laughs> okay, no, that, that's, that's interesting. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we'll wrap it up on, on these two questions. Okay. What is your favorite thing about the hobby? The cool animals. <laughs> 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 uh, my favorite thing about the hobby, yeah, is, is the animals, but also the way that the hobby is evolving mm -hmm. from essentially a hoarding situation <laughs> where um consideration for their habitat is not as much of a consideration as it should be yeah. and now the emphasis is on like beautiful bioactive natural um like homes for these animals that have either been born into or taken out of the wild i shouldn't say born into that have been born into the trade never experiencing yeah. the wild or taken straight out of the wild so recreating like a very close to nature environment for them. I think that's really cool. Um, and yeah, just that we're, we're valuing that more and more we're every day. Evolving. I think a, a lot of the, the like YouTubers and like influencer type people that are influencer. <laughs> just such a, oh, what is it? Like a, a word. Yeah, blank word. Yeah. What's the word for the What's word? What's the word for the word? <laughs> yeah. Um, all the YouTubers and the influencers that show their, like, beautiful... Setups, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, so I agree. like, wow, well, like, these animals are so lucky. They get to live in, like, these huge enclosures that are, like... They don't even know that they're not in the wild. Yes, they do, but, like, at least they're not depressed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
so yeah, so the, the push for better, bigger and better in, in enclosures and in care. And like treating the enclosure like its own, like that's the pet. Right, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like putting so much care into the enclosure and like wanting the plants in there to do well, choosing, curating those plants to look good and be accurate to the environment that like said species comes from. Yeah. Like, that's cool, I think that's super cool. That, yeah, like a biotope, creating a biotope almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would like to get into that. I, I feel like it would be very, it would make it more fun to be building the enclosures, but mm -hmm. I, I, I struggle to find plants from the areas that the animals are from in, or at least here. Like it's very, that, that's the hardest thing I think about sourcing. I mean, yeah, biotope. like in plant importing and animal importing. Same, same thing. thing, absolutely, yeah. Probably a little less rules for the plants. Yeah. I assume, I don't uh, know, but uh, yeah. Okay, and then what is one piece of advice that you would give keepers? Um, the question here written is like for, to keep your collection healthy, but it, honestly, not even just to keep your collection healthy, just even if you have one or two pets, like what is just one piece of advice? To keep your animals healthy. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> no and get a relationship with a vet that sees exotics mm -hmm. so that you have it in your back pocket when something comes up, when an illness arises that you need treatment for. Mm. Because it's so hard to find a vet. If you notice something, some kind of illness in your pet that you're like, okay, I have a little bit of time to like find a vet or something. And it's gonna take you just two weeks to find a vet. And then, and then the vet doesn't have an opening for mm -hmm. another month is an issue. Mm -hmm. So um, find a vet, switch to a vet, <laughs> um, to help you when these things come up on quick, on a quick timeline. Mm -hmm. um, because that's going to save your pets. <laughs> save your animals. Yeah, because reptiles and amphibians, for a lot of the species that are kept in captivity, they have long lifespans. And the chances of an illness coming up during their lifetime, most likely, most likely, most likely it's gonna happen. So yeah. you got, just gotta be ready when that happens. You gotta monitor them. You gotta, don't ignore them. Don't let them become part of the furniture. You know, just like they're, they are there. They're still your pets. They're sentient. Yes, so yes, yes. Make sure that they're taken care of. All animals and plants are sentient. And plants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> monitor your plants. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so. That's perfectly leads in to kind of how we're gonna wrap this up. Um, how can people book uh, an appointment with Swift Tail Vet and then where can they find you? You as Swift Tail Vet and you as Reed. <laughs> Swift Tail Vet, um, you can book on swifttailvet.com. Um, there is a booking portal there that you can create a profile that gets automatically put into our vet software. Um, and then from there you can request an appointment. It takes you through the intake form and then we approve it on our end because you have to be in Ontario right now. Um, you have to be in Ontario. So we just have to confirm that before you go ahead and <laughs> do the appointment. Um, and then, yeah, you get connected with a vet and oh, you know you get to talk to them about your pet and uh, we send meds across Ontario. So wherever you are, for now. we'll get it to you for now. For now. For now. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. <laughs> awesome. Who knows when we'll be expanding, but... Um, yeah. Awesome. And then you as Reed, where can people find you and follow you? Uh, so I'm on Instagram as Basil Exotics. Uh, hopefully we'll be posting a lot more soon. Um, yes, but Basil be. Exotics, yeah, yeah, is Instagram. Um, and Swiftail Vet is also on Instagram as Swiftail Vet. So you can follow both of us there. Awesome. And as usual, all those links will be in the show notes or... The YouTube description or wherever you're listening to this. Reed, thank you very, very much for coming on and doing thank this. This is awesome. And uh, we need to do it again at some point. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So go give Reed and Swift Tail Vet a follow. Thank you all very much for listening and we will see you on the next one. Bye. <laughs>